So I will say good morning as Danielle is setting me up uh, with my presentation. You know how it goes. Once the technology works, then you feel I'm in business. So I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank Joy and Ana Lucia for inviting me. And I'm happy to have met Danielle. And uh, uh, I'm very grateful for all of her help in getting me going. Uh, I look forward to getting to know many more of you. Uh, everything that you do and your commitment to things that I care about, uh, I, it, I, it's really a privilege and an honor to be here. Uh, I know that many of the things that I've written were published before some of you were born. You know, and that gets a bit depressing as one gets older, right? But nevertheless, I'm hoping that I said something that we built on and can continue to build on. So I want to start by talking about my presentation, and it's kind of a, an exercise in speed reading. So I'm going to sort of take you very fast to a number of thoughts and, and, and ideas um, that I hope uh, we can build on as the day goes on. So I'm going to start out by telling you that the United States is changing. I'm also going to tell you that the world is changing. And in the, in the light of these changes, conversations about non-English languages and their place in American society have taken on a new urgent tone. Can everybody hear me? Uh, I'm not sure I was close to the mic. So these conversations have been deeply influenced by debates about the need for immigration reform and concerns about the composition of the American citizenry. So that's the reality that we're in today. So those of us that are engaged in teaching heritage and community languages face many challenges. And I like to put pictures of children right? because, in fact, that reminds us that that's who we care about. And in this presentation, I'm going to focus on questions of identity, engagement, and pedagogy that affect the future of heritage language communities in the United States. And what I'm going to talk about is what is it that we do when we teach languages? Right? Because many of us, even though we are not in schools, are really in schools. Community schools are schools. And what is very interesting is that once we actually move into schools, we begin to think like schools. And that sometimes can be positive, and sometimes it may not be entirely positive. So I want to talk about the process of teaching languages and what that involves and why identity matters. Right? If we don't keep before us the idea that identity matters a great deal to the students, that we want to make certain that they retain a heritage language, that we might be in trouble. So I'm not going to say very much about what counts as a heritage language because Marta already told us what we know about, uh, about definitions. And as you know, my own definition is, uh, has always focused on proficiency. I really think that the personal connection is very, very important. But because I teach languages, then it really matters to me that I decide the pedagogy or can, can design the pedagogy so that it's appropriate. If you already understand the most subtle of humor, I don't want to start with Buenos Dias Juan. Right? That would be absurd. right? But in many language programs, that's in fact what happens right? when people discount what comes from the home. So Rampton and some other researchers uh, have pointed out that uh, learners' relationships with supposed heritage languages are complicated. So students come with us with language inheritance. That means it comes from the home. But it may not be that they have a language affiliation. <laughs> They may feel no attachment. They may feel no identification. Right. So the, the inheritance does not necessarily mean that there is affiliation. And clearly, the inheritance does not, does not necessarily mean that there is language expertise. So these differences matter, but may not be taken into account in the design of heritage language teaching programs. And this is what worries me. So many of us here are specifically concerned about expertise and about the development of heritage languages, because we want them to develop. Right? We know that it's one thing to acquire a heritage language, and quite another to develop it, to do many other things. Okay? To work in the world with that language involves some development. And if our schools are totally in English, that isn't going to happen. That development, so much of any language, happens in school settings. We learn how to do particular things like reading and writing in schools. right? So that is part of language development, not necessarily language acquisition. So according to some scholars, Fishman among them, Carlos Guardado among others, and if you haven't read Carlos Guardado, he's a wonderful researcher who's in Canada, who writes a great deal about issues about intergenerational trans the transmission. And, as, 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 and, and Joshua Fishman always told us that he believed in you're not going to maintain the heritage language unless you have the grandmother. Okay? Actually, and I'm a grandmother, so I can tell you my grandchildren all speak Spanish. They better speak Spanish, otherwise they don't have a grandmother. Right? It's just that's very simple. So, uh, so it 
it matters, that intergenerational uh, transmission, that transmitting the value. And clearly the affiliation to the ethnic group will matter a great deal, and schools and language programs can. Joshua Fishman didn't believe in schools. Okay? Joshua Fishman actually wrote a number of times in my last article, on, uh, which actually appeared, the one on, that has that term survivance in it that I'm happy to tell you about. Um, that particular article uh, spoke to, to Josh's belief that if we depended on schools, we were lost, which is why your efforts of being community schools matters, right? That you're not necessarily in the public schools, that you may be doing school-like things and you may be actually teaching, but you don't depend on the public schools for what you want to do. So my remarks today then are going to focus a bit on teaching of heritage languages and then issues of affiliation and identity. But I'm going to take you a little bit on a journey uh, before I, be, I go get to identity because I want a couple of things uh, to be present in our conversation. So the teaching of, uh, as you know, the teaching of heritage community languages include attempts to rescue languages that are disappearing. In many parts of the world, what this involves is the community is saying, I do not want my language to disappear. I want to make certain I'm going to create a language nest, as the Maori have done. I'm going to bring the elders, because I don't want this language to disappear. And in other cases, it, there are attempts to maintain or develop the, the, the languages of origin. And most of us who are in Korean, and Mandarin, and Cantonese, and Spanish, and Greek, and, and now I hear about Lithuanian. Don't you love it? Right? I was so delighted to know that we had Lithuanian here. Um, so, so we know that these efforts are different. So when we want to relate to the public schools, the challenge is how to get on the menu. Right? Because you know, public schools have a menu of commonly taught languages, and we also have those uncommonly taught languages, but they really are uncommonly taught. Right? So that if you want to learn Farsi, you can't learn it in a public school right now. It's not offered in high school. It doesn't begin in junior high. Right? So we have this incredible uh, limitation that we cannot have the schools do what we want. But there are a lot of different approaches to teaching uh, or developing heritage languages. So some of them may be these grassroots kinds of, of, of movements. Uh, Carlos Guardado has written about a number of them, where they're playgroups, for example, where you have a Girl Scout troop that is done totally in a heritage language. You might actually have the teaching of doctrina. Okay? At church, you have religious teaching at any number of churches. Religious teachings, but you're using the heritage language to do all of the religious teaching. right? So you have content there, but you also have a vehicle that is a heritage language. You have all of the community organizations, which you so well know and represent. And you have, obviously, these programs that are within school that may be called bilingual programs, and uh, they vary in terms of how aligned they are with those state requirements of actually producing students who do in English everything they need to do to be educated in this country, to be able to, to, to uh, participate in American society, and that's very, very important. But, but some of those, those bilingual programs, depending on what their purpose is, are more or less aligned with the schools themselves. And of course, we also have those wonderful foreign language programs, and as I say, the foreign language programs, we have struggled many cases. And Spanish does not have many community schools. I don't know if you if you noticed that there was only a couple of colleagues here, right? But it's we've never had Saturday schools. Okay? We just simply have not had Saturday schools. We depend on being on the menu, right? But being on the menu has also created a difficulty for us in terms of being able to say it really matters to us to maintain Spanish. It's not just a vehicle toward English. So there have been two general approaches. Okay? And one general approach in the teaching of heritage languages is language as the subject of instruction. That's really what I'm doing, what I'm doing in my Saturday program. Language is the focus, or language is a vehicle. Okay? Language is the medium of instruction. So if language is the focus, language itself is the primary focus of everything I do. I want to teach you to read and write. That's why you're here. We're not doing anything else. Or I have a subject matter, and I'm using the subject matter because I want to interest you. Okay? So I'm bringing you in okay, under the guise of doing something else. But I'm doing it in the language, and that itself helps the language grow. But there's a difference between the two of those. So in every case, the teaching of languages in school or school-like settings involves what I'm calling curricularizing language. Right? And I've been writing a lot about curricularizing language because I hadn't quite thought about it that way. But here's what I mean. When language is curricularized, it's treated not as a species-specific, unique communicative system acquired naturally in the process of ordinary socialization or primary socialization, but as a curricular subject. Right? 
or skill, the elements of which have to be ordered and sequenced, practiced and studied, learned and tested in artificial con uh, context. If you think about this for a moment, okay, language is not a subject like history or like, um, or like math. Uh, it is not a well-ordered a well discipline. Language is something that you live. Language is lived, right? When someone says, how do you acquire language? You live language, right? But we have to cut it up. As soon as you decide in school that you're gonna teach it, you gotta cut it up, okay? You gotta decide, I'm, going to, I'm going to select textbooks, I'm going to train teachers, I'm going to do this before that. Why this before that, right? Oh, because that's how I did it in my country? I mean, so there are all kinds of decisions that one goes into. So, the process of curricularizing language then involves what I'm going to suggest to you is a series of, of uh, concentric circles of related mechanisms that if you think about, we can get down to identity okay? and where identity fits into all of this. I promise you I will get to identity. Bear with me. You look a little doubtful. No, you don't look a little doubtful. I'm just, yeah, I'm just kidding you. So how I imagine that we have to think about what we do when we teach language, when we curricularize language, we clearly have core program elements. These are the, the bulk of what we do. Those decisions that we make about this book, not that book, or if I do a book or don't do a book, and whether or not I actually give you grammatical terminology to talk about the language or I don't give you grammatical terminology, how I teach you the writing system, how I don't teach you the writing system. But all of that is affected by the policies and, and, and the context and, and, and the traditions that surround wherever your program is. And more importantly, there's ideological and theoretical mechanisms that affect everything that you do. What you think that language is, okay? If you think that language is form, that's what you're going to teach. If you think that language is language, that language is a social practice, okay, that what you're doing okay, is engaging and in inviting students to use language across a lifetime, that's quite different. That conceptualization of language will take you into that inner circle to do very different things. So, if I, just for a moment, to think about some of these core program elements, and as I told you, this is exercise in speed reading, so don't worry about it, here it is. So things like uh, the program goals okay, uh, really matter a lot, and those, of course, obviously lead to instructional materials and instructional approaches and instructor competencies and learner categorizations and dreaded assessments, right? And I say dreaded assessments because all of those things have got to connect. And if we have a particular stakeholder group that wants evidence that you did your job, assessments are very much in style. And we have all kinds of debates about what assessment can measure and whether we know how to measure language. I'm one of those that don't think we know how to measure language, right? To sample just a little bit of what you can do in language in no way tells you exactly how you have learned language. So. Program goals, for example, in heritage language instruction could be either maintenance oriented or academically oriented, right? And you can see probably some of your programs, some of them are very maintenance oriented and others are, might much be more academically oriented. So if you're in maintenance oriented, you actually bring all your children to meet and play and you want them to enjoy them, themselves, have a good time, talk about something. Uh, you might provide a context in which language is used naturally for an engaging purpose and you provide a context in which the group or community identity is affirmed, right? So again, here's an example of the Boy Scout troop, the Girl Scout troop. Okay? We come together because we're doing something else, but we're creating play groups okay, of children who will use those languages together, right? Because we don't have that happen if they're in public schools. If you're academically oriented, and, that, and that's, it's, it's, it's a choice that you're making in terms of program goals, you're doing something like, I want to make sure they read and write. And reading and writing is absolutely important, right? So we're not saying that you can't have a play group that wouldn't take you to reading and writing. But a lot of the programs decide we're doing one thing or another. We're developing the standard or prestige variety, right? Some groups worry an enormous amount okay, that the language that they so love is eroding okay, uh, away from, from the mother country, right? And so then there's a lot of, of, a lot of attention devoted to maintaining that prestige language. Uh, and there might also be uh, a, a focus, especially in bilingual programs, dual immersion programs, to learning content through that language. So those are some examples of program goals. Okay? But those program goals, I'm going to suggest, are in fact informed by all kinds of policies, contexts, and traditions, so that you have educational policies. If you're tied into the public schools, you better respect those, language, those educational policies. You have an institutional climate. Who hosts your Saturday group? Okay? 
Is it in fact a religious organization? Is it a community organization? What are their hopes? What are their traditions that, that surround you? Uh, and are there language standards? We have wonderful language standards that ACTFL puts out, right? To what degree do those language standards uh, in, in, in some way inform what you're doing? And what are learner expectations? What do the kids want to do? What do the parents want? Okay. So all of those things, immediately, if you start examining your goals, you'll see how they fit into this larger, this larger circle. And then there are, of course, those theoretical mechanisms. And I'm going to say a bit more about the theoretical mechanisms. I'm going to be selective here just a bit. So here are the theoretical mechanisms in larger print, so you can see them, right? And so as you can see, they involve what your theories of language acquisition are, what your theories of bilingualism are, what you think language is, and what your ideologies of language, race, class, and identity, right? Which is where identity comes in, right? So, but first I'm going to talk about theories of bilingualism, right? And I would ask you, how many of you here are bilingual? Wow. Every single hand comes up, right? And what's amazing to me is if I ask this in a class, right, and I'm teaching a class right now at Stanford, it's called Issues in, in, in the Study of Bilingualism, and if I ask this, I get all of these quibbles. Well, a real bilingual is this or a real bilingual is that. I'm not really bilingual because kinds of business. But all of you put up your hands, right, which is wonderful. I'm sure that if we got down to the definitions, and I'm going to suggest that we need to think about these definitions when we design a program, right, we might have different definitions. So. How we define bilingualism matters a great deal, right? And so I, I, I'm always putting this cartoon forward because I, I, I really like it. So in the United States, unfortunately, popular beliefs about bilingualism in the American context go back a long way. And in fact, many people thought that monolingualism was the crowning attribute of citizenship, right? As long as we left those old languages behind, right? And everyone has quoted Theodore Roosevelt saying that, right? So that was one particular ideology that existed in the American context. So there are strong ideologies about the negative consequences of bilingualism, the advantages of the right kinds of bilingualism. Okay. And in this national ideological discourse, bilinguals are narrowly described sometimes as two educated monolingual native speakers in one person. Persons who have perfect control of two language systems can pass undetected among monolinguals of each of their languages, can translate easily between their two languages and can carry out the same functions identically in each of their languages. Right? Interesting tall order. Okay? So we, in the educational discourse, we tend to talk about real bilinguals and true bilinguals and balanced bilinguals and incipient bilinguals and emerging bilinguals and early bilinguals and late bilinguals and semilinguals. Right? Okay? And so you don't want to be a semilingual. Right? But every time you put an adjective in front of bilingual, I caution you right, that you're actually saying something about what bilingualism is or is not, right? When someone says, well, you know, she's a real bilingual, that means the rest of us aren't, right? She's a real, but however your definition is, right? You can do everything in both. So, but bilinguals are much more complicated. And I know that all of you will see this. We're not like monolinguals, right? See, the thing about it is I've got two systems in my head, and at any moment, if I get just a little bit flustered, I'm going to talk about weekly and I leave, and I really want to say I live, and most of the time I can control the phonology, but if I'm excited or I'm angry, the other sound system shows through, right? That never happens to a monolingual. Have you noticed that? <laughs> right? Monolinguals don't have another system that can show through, right? So obviously we're not like monolinguals in any way. So we know that our two language systems interact. We carry out different functions. We establish relationships in different languages. Think about what languages you speak to your parents, right? And what would happen if you spoke to them in English? If I ever spoke to my mother in English, she would be, my husband doesn't speak English, uh, doesn't speak Spanish, so when she came to visit us, and she's now passed away, but when she would come to visit us, she would all speak in English out of respect to my husband who wanted to include him. And at the end of the conversation, I would say, did you really mean that? Because I couldn't read her signals. Right? When we were speaking in Spanish, I always knew, oh, you know, she's being funny, she's being facetious, she's being sarcastic. But when she spoke in English, I didn't have her signals. Right? So it is not the case that we practice language with people. Right? I caution you, when you say to your kid, oh, go practice blah, blah, blah with Johnny. Right? Well, Johnny and your kid have a relationship in whatever language they established. That is not neutral. Right? Your living language, and for you to speak in a language that you haven't established a relationship in, you're doing something different. At least be aware of it. You may actually need to have kids practice each, with each other, but understand that you're doing something artificial. 
that it's not exactly the same thing. So we have special, we specialize. Okay? What we do when we speak in one language or another, we clearly know okay, that we, some, some subjects we have thought about deeply in one language. And when we want to talk about them in our other language, we have to think about them in that language. We have to prepare to think about them in that language, right? It isn't, we, it's not like, you know, that, that it's that simple. So more importantly, what I want you to know is that bilinguals are not two native speakers in one. I just want to keep that little boy or that little man in your head. We are not two native speakers in one person. That is not the fact. So if that is your goal, okay? When you think about heritage language maintenance, you're not going to get there. And you're not going to get there, and that's good that you're not going to get there. You're going to have individuals who are complicated, complex, okay, and can use those two languages in many important ways, right? But they're not going to be those two native speakers, whatever that means, in one. Right? And what's nice is that the research is now killing the native speakers. They, why were we using the native speaker as somebody to mention or to, to, to measure ourselves against? So that's what's happening. There are many questions about the ways in which bilingualism, bilinguals have been viewed, and here's the notion of native speaker as a standard for conceptualizing bilingualism has been problematized extensively. I can tell you many, many people that are writing about this. So if you're still talking about the native speaker norm, and in many cases people have said, who is that mythical native speaker? And it was always the educated native speaker. You know, you really didn't want that country guy, okay? That fellow who in fact was a perfect speaker of whatever variety of language they spoke in the countryside, you didn't want them at a model for anybody, right? So in fact, okay, if whatever family came from the countryside and they were speakers of a variety of language that was not highly valued, right, you didn't consider them native speakers. And they could be monolingual. Well, what could they be, right? So you notice how it's complicated? When you use this term, it wasn't very useful for us. So the field has changed. And May, who's an, uh, a researcher from New Zealand, has referred to these changes as the multilingual turn in applied linguistics. So applied linguistics is not the old applied linguistics. If you're as old as I am, I have seen the changes, right? So if I'm not changing with the tide, I might as well actually stop writing, right? So I gotta keep on reading so I can keep on writing, right? And what I know now is that in fact this multilingual turn is upon us. So I have to give up on a number of things. And what's wonderful, there's some nice critical scholars that can point to some of my old writing and say, oh, Guadalupe, you said this such and such a year. Yeah, I did, that's how we used to talk about it. We're not talking about it that way anymore, but it hasn't quite trickled down to a number of the practitioners in the field who are still stuck in the old literature, right? And so some of my stuff, I would say, don't read that anymore, right? Uh, we were thinking in particular ways, but we're not thinking that way anymore. So the natural consequence of an increasingly globalized world has changed the way that we think about that, and we've rejected the tendency to view individuals who are acquiring a second language or maintaining a heritage language as failed native speakers. Notice how awful that would be. If we have a model that our children that we're trying to maintain that language in aren't ever going to reach, right? So someone who's a Spanish speaker that grows up in California, okay, away from the border, right, with some contact with Spanish that is really, he can use that Spanish, but he doesn't sound like he came from the middle of Madrid, right? That isn't going to happen. Doesn't come from Mexico City. Doesn't come from La Habana either, right? Okay? That language has evolved. And even Miami speakers of, of Spanish have now drifted away from what they spoke when the first generations came, right? So that always happens. Language continues to change. And those of us who are here, in Spanish we would say, se nos va la lengua, okay? Language kind of just kind of erodes away from you, okay? You're using English a lot more, right? And even as a grandmother insisting that we speak whatever language it is at my dinner table, right? Language begins to erode. It's like Ricardo Otegi said, we have a lot of angloconceptos, a lot of things to talk about that we never talked about in those languages. And slowly, okay, that erosion takes place. So, the other things that we have to talk about are ideologies of language, race, class, and identity. And here I get to talking about identity a little bit more. So what are language ideologies, those evil things, language ideologies? No, they're not necessarily evil things, but they, 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 they have, a, they have a, a negative side to them. So we could talk about language ideologies as unexamined ideas and beliefs that shape people's thinking about language and about those who use language, right? 
So that person used language in a particular way. Ooh, did you notice that? Hmm, not good language, clearly not very intelligent, clearly not very articulate, right? So we have ideologies, or there's an accent there, right? Or that person doesn't use this particular tense, right? And we use it a whole lot, right? So these ideologies can be multiple and conflicting. They include notions of what is true, morally good, or aesthetically pleasing about language, including who speaks and does not speak correctly. So ideologies of language include very, very many unexamined beliefs about the relationship between language and identity. So let me say a little bit about identity then. There are essentialist views of identity. And when I talk about essentialist views of identity, they take the position that individuals' identities, that is, the sense of who they are, where they belong, and why. That's identity. Who am I? Where do I belong? And why? Okay. Would be getting, getting at identity very deeply. And the essentialist views would say these are static and unchanging. Okay. I'm a Mexican from northern Mexico, and that's all that I am. I'm a female, female Mexican from the north, from the north part of, 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 of Mexico. And so that's definitely one of my identities, but I have many other identities, right? And sometimes it's the female that arrives, and sometimes it is this pugnacious, okay, uh, what I would call in Spanish, mujer de pelo en pecho, a woman that has hair on her chest, right? And I arrive fighting deeply, not, not one of these nice, wonderful, docile females that were part of my identity as I grew up, because that's what females were then at that generation. So our identities are ever-changing. We bring many into the room with us. It's not just one thing that we're doing. The relationship between uh, certain things like national identity and ethnic identity and religious identity and language is often taken for granted. There's a lot of, of, of writing about this. I put up the book cover of one book that I highly recommend. Uh, also, English with an Accent, if you haven't read English with an Accent, it's a lovely, lovely book all about ideologies of language, particularly about those of us who come to this country and have an accent, right? You may want to do, do that. And we often forget that language identity is also racial. Racial identity and language identity are put in together. This is a wonderful book that actually explores that, lots of essays about that, about the fact that sometimes when people see the color of someone's skin, the language could be perfect, but they're really hearing race, right? They're hearing incorrectness because of race, right? And now we're beginning, I think, to talk in more ways within the field not ignoring it, saying we've got to talk about the color of people's skin and how they're seen in a context in which race is present, racism continues to be an important aspect of our experiences. Now Norton, who probably wrote the most about, this is Bonnie Norton, who wrote most about identity, she points out that the theories of language and identity have highly influenced the teaching of second languages. Right? So all of her work relates to second languages. So concepts such as investment, for example, Bonnie Norton talks about the fact that students actually, it's not a question of whether they're motivated or not. It's a question of whether they invest or not in wanting to learn a particular language. And the same thing would be true of our heritage language learners. Will they invest? She often talks about the fact that they're deeply committed to learning, but they may not invest in the practices in that classroom. Right? They came to your classroom, but you were doing that very boring grammar. And they said, that's not what I want to do with language, right? So they will not invest in the practices of that. And she talks a lot about that learners bring with them notions, ooh, hmm, what do you think happened? Yeah. We'll find Danielle. We'll find Danielle. <laughs> do you think I disconnected us? Hmm. I can continue talking, actually looking at my own stuff without necessarily having a visual. Will that work? Yeah, I'll just, can I keep Yes, you can keep, you can, you keep <laughs> fiddling and I'll keep talking. So uh, at any rate, so one of the other things that, that, that Bonnie Norton talks about is imagined communities. Imagined communities and also imagined identities. So what learners do is they imagine themselves as belonging to a particular community. So one of the things that we want to do as language teachers is to bring those imagined communities to those children. Right? If they can't imagine themselves, okay, and it can, again, if I think of my own, uh, my own role in, in making certain that, that, that 
my own children and grandchildren maintain language, I have a vision of what I want their participation in my world is. Okay? But it has to be their world. They have to imagine themselves, their imagined identities in that world. There was one point in which my daughter, who was then 13, right, and I sent her to the cousins. One of the ways in which we maintained language was sending her to the cousins, right? So sending her to the cousins. And at one point, my daughter says, you know, I can't flirt in Spanish. It really worried her a great deal. So her imagined participation in that world in which her cousins, but not she lived, uh, involved being able to flirt well. Yes. So. Uh, oh, did it? oh, I did play something. Okay. That's all right. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Oh. oh. I'm gonna scroll all the way. Oh, it came back, didn't it? Oh, how wonderful. All right, Daniel, you're a miracle worker. Okay. So, if it's a quick review. Yes. 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 It's gonna be. I said it was gonna be fast, but I'm gonna hope to get to the very end of my slides. I don't know how to get to the end of my slides. Does somebody know how to get to my end of my slides? Um, to where I was. Uh, I'm almost there. Uh, uh, almost there, almost there, almost there. Yes, I'm happy to share these slides, absolutely, yes. And that's why I write them this way, because I share them with the audience. And as you'll notice, I'm really writing a paper on slides, right? That's really what I'm doing. So, um, so then you'll have it all, everything that I said, and you'll remember me forever. So. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, so we, here we were at the imagined communities and the imagined identities, and so that every time that language learners speak, read, or write, they're also organizing and reorganizing a sense of who they are and how they relate to the social world, right? So make no mistake, if you really have those children on Saturdays, okay, working on that particular language, you want them to imagine themselves in a real world that they care about that possibly moves just beyond their grandmother. I know I'm very important to my children, my grandchildren, but they need to imagine themselves doing other things in the world. So from the perspective of the teaching and learning of heritage languages, then research persuades that identity matters a great deal. There's been a lot of research, and I'm putting up a number of things that then I'll share with you, so then you'll have. Okay. Um, so for example, the work of, of He, Agnes He, who has done an enormous amount on Chinese, the work that I've recently just discovered because of Joy, she sent me this article to learn about the West Africans and what's happening with West Africans, right? And the very fact that that's a different way of thinking about heritage languages, languages that people used in schools, and then they come to this country, and this country might not be aware of the sophistication of the fact that these young people come with this French that we value so highly, right? So how we actually send to them the message that the fact that they have this language that's a European language that they've already studied in, right, is very valued and we want them to maintain it may, makes a great deal of difference. We have the work of Sarah Shin, and Sarah Shin has worked a lot on Korean, as has Jin Suk Lee, and I don't have her up there, right? And, and Sarah, uh, Jin Suk Lee was a former student of mine at Stanford, and they work a lot on heritage language and Korean. And, but now the mixed families begin to be important to us, right? Uh, and whether, uh, whether, um, um, whether we have looked at it closely or not, these are challenges, right? That one parent, one, one language uh, is, is, is something that we want to make certain that, that we attend to. So all of this work affirms that the heritage language learner brings with himself, and I love this, ambiguities and complications that are typically absent in first or second language learners, right? So all of these complications, that heritage learner, that's, that's really much more difficult than the ordinary second language learner. So when you have dual immersion programs, right? And by dual immersion programs or dual language programs, I'm talking about two-way, because I'm, I'm trying to be very precise in my terminology. If you actually have two-way, you have two sets of children in the same room, you have very different kinds of learners. You need to be aware of the fact that those identities are profoundly different, and you can't minimize them, right? And I believe that one of the ways in which we actually can do this well, make certain that we have a bilingual population in the United States, is with a, with a two-way, the two-way immersion, but we have challenges, and that's what I want us to be aware of. So, um, and I'm not going to talk a great deal about this, but there have been scholars who have talked about how does ethnic awareness grow, and the fact that when children are very little, they're not aware that they even have an ethnic awareness that might move to an ambivalence, that could move to 
an emerging, possibly in junior high and high school, they begin to say, oh, I'm an X, I'm not a Y. Right? Uh, and then they might say, okay, I really want to be an, uh, an X and not a Y, and I'll never be a Y, I have to be an X. Right? So all of that emergence and identity incorporation uh, it involves the view of possible selves. Okay? So we have possible selves, a heritage language student could be at any stage okay, when, we come, when the student comes to us. They could be rejecting it. I'm sending them to Saturday school and they're furious at their mother because they're rejecting being sent, right? They could have a strong identification and activism. Okay, help me see how I can use my language to change the world. Okay? Uh, I want to tie in with the problems going on in the country that we came from, right? It matters to me. It could be total indifference, or it could be the exploration of a future role in this mythic past. A number of scholars really think, well, let's not use the term heritage because it points to the past. Well, for some people, they think the past is really great. Other people don't like the past, right? And so it depends on where you are in all of this. So Ofelia Garcia has pointed out that the greatest failure of contemporary education has been precisely its inability to help teachers understand, and I like the way she put it, the ethno-linguistic complexity of children, classrooms, speech communities, and society in a way to enable them to make informed decisions about language and culture in classrooms. Right? So we certainly don't want to be part of that greatest failure. Right? We want to keep in mind that we need to understand that ethno-linguistic complexity. We, in particular, in what we do. Right? We have no excuse if we don't. Okay? It's OK if the public schools don't do this, but we can't afford to do that. So our students in our heritage language programs, we have the opportunity to influence their developing identities. We know that identity is a production that is never complete. It's always in process. So it's never quite completed. Right? You're always going to change. And what we need to remember is that language is also transformed as an academic subject and curricularized. And Sometimes with the very best intentions, all language programs are influenced by our ideologies of race and class, et cetera, and the conceptualizations of language, conceptualizations of what's a good variety of language, um, about acquisition, about bilingualism. So I want you to remember that whatever you do, you're here. <laughs> you really are. Your goals are really informed by broader things that you probably want to examine. At some point, you want to take the time just to say, how are we thinking about this? Is this coherent? Okay. Is it something that is likely to succeed over time? So it's influenced then by the backgrounds of the teachers and their identities as the members of the ethnic American community who your teachers are. I have known of programs in Saturday schools where they've imported, because their language is so good, people who have just arrived from that mother country. Right? But those teachers haven't dealt with American students. Right? That's a biggie. right? American students aren't as disciplined as they were in some countries. They don't have the background. And so before you know that, you have a real, real mess. Right? That's all that it is, a real mess. Lots of hopes. But those people who came in have never experienced American, uh, American students. So their acceptance or challenge of the he hegemonic ideologies of language purity and bilingualism. So these people that you bring in from the mother country may be in, but this is not purity. It has anglicisms with these horrible things that are anglicisms. We have to wipe them all out. Well, you can't wipe them all out. Okay? You're talking about things you never talked about in the languages that, that you brought with you. So engagement is incredibly important in both communities and formal school settings. Uh, the ability to engage students is really the secret. Can you engage them? Can you have your program goals be realistic, respond to the possible, uh, the possible uh, goals of students? So they can be very narrow goals, or they can be broader goals. So for example, a narrow goal, they'll develop native-like writing abilities, and a broad goal would be students will use the language for personal purposes across a lifetime. I would argue that what you want is the broad goal. Okay? The question is, how can the narrow goals take you to the broad goal? Okay? Are they contradictory? If they're contradictory, you're not going to accomplish your broad goal. Right? So if you disengage okay, students with very narrow goals, you're not going to get to the broad goals. So for some students, language is a commodity. For other students, it's a vehicle for self-discovery activism and influence and affiliation. So one size does not fit all. You'll notice I'm speeding up because I need to have you ask me questions. And uh, those of us who work in the heritage language teaching profession, I'm going to argue, and I'm within two slides of finishing, uh, we need to be thoughtful, strategic, and flexible. Okay. 
So to be thoughtful is really important and to be strategic. Every community is different. You've got to be strategic with what will work with that community, with those learners, with that, yeah. that population, and being flexible enough to know, well, one year we were doing that and it didn't work. We brought all these teachers and it just didn't work. So we're not going to do that anymore. So in designing programs, because we are really wanting to maintain our beloved languages for another generation, I think most of us would say. Uh, what Joshua Fishman said, and he wrote that wonderful book called In Praise of the Beloved Language. Right? There's something there about language that makes it very beloved. It cannot be changed or, or, or simply uh, traded in for a better one okay, without costs. So the stakes are high. So in order to design programs that will invite students to take joy in their bilingualism, and I hope that those are the programs that we're designing, those that students will take joy in their bilingualism, we need to understand how teaching itself can undermine or support those goals. Thank you. And there's my email address. I'm happy to correspond with you, and I'm happy to take questions. Do we have time for questions? And the slides will be posted, as we said. And is, the, is this talk going to be the, up on the website? Is yes, it recorded? It's being, it's being recorded. It'll take a little bit of time to get it up, because we have to do captions at the end of it. So you can show the talk to your colleagues or whatever. So we have 15 minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Laura. You're welcome. You asked an incredibly hard question, okay? And you ask an incredible, I mean, I'm engaged right now in writing with another scholar a review article on what has been written on translanguaging, right? And that's a new concept, uh, and a new concept, and one of the articles in which, when, in which I've, uh, that, that Joy alluded to, that I, I talk about sandwiching, polylanguaging, translanguaging, and code switching. Uh, that article says, in the teaching of languages, we always embraced a monolingual orthodoxy. Right? That meant you taught the target language in the target language. That was the ideal. Of course, you knew you couldn't always do that. And I'm now talking about second language right? teaching. Right? We taught in that language. And in bilingual education, we also believed that, in, that they had to be separated, because if they were not separated, then you wouldn't get enough of A or enough of B. Right? So we clearly, we did a lot of things in the early days of bilingual education. We had days that we did A in, days that we did B in. We did these subjects in A, these subjects in B, the morning in A, the afternoon in B, all kinds of combinations. Right? But the belief, the theory underlining it, was that you needed enough of it to be able to acquire it. Right? Right? And this is assuming a learner that comes in at zero language. Right? Now, some of our children that are coming in are not at zero language. They actually are already dual language acquirers. Right? They have been in a milieu, in a world in which their brothers and sisters have been using language B, the language of the society, and their parents may be using language A. Right? Okay. So they're already using those two languages, and they're using those resources in those particular ways. And the, the, the scholars who, who are very much in favor of translanguaging, they're saying, well, let's use those language resources in education. Right? So if your interest is educating these kids, and, and educating I'm going to define as developing fine minds. Right? For me, that's what I want to do in education. I want to develop fine minds. Right? So if your interest is in developing fine minds, okay, in addition to maintaining the language, right? but if I have to choose between maintaining the language and developing fine minds, I will tell you I'll develop fine minds. Right? 
It's very clear to me what I want for the population of kids I care about, right? But nevertheless, so you have a theory on how best to do that. So right now, one of the problems that we're having is that there's a huge debate in the field about how we think about this. We don't have the research base to know. For example, if you have a two-way immersion program, children of speakers of language A and speakers of language B, they're coming together. How much can you use translanguaging and still have the students who arrive without one of those languages actually acquire? That's an acquisition question, right? The jury is out, right? So, so in so many cases, what I've said in that particular article that I'm happy to send you, okay, uh, and it will be published in a collection that won't be out for another two years, but it, it, that's always what happens with edited books, right? But, but what I'm arguing in, in, that, in that particular article is you need to know your program, you need to know your students, you need to know who you're teaching to and for, right? And then you can make decisions about what that will be. We know that, that the other thing that is undergirding the notion of translanguaging, it's probably more information that you want, is a huge debate about whether or not there are really codes that are separate, whether you want to think of language as separate codes, or whether you want to think about languages as resources. And if you think about separate codes, you use the term code switching, okay? and you use code switch from code A to code B. And if you're thinking that, in fact, we don't really need the concept of language or codes anymore, it's old fashioned, let's throw it out. Uh, and some people have actually thrown out the concept of language per se, right? So if you've thrown it out, then you're going to talk about translanguaging much more than you are going to use the term code switching. Too long, a, too long an answer, I know. Thank you for the nice presentation. Um, on the last slide, you said uh, one size does not fit for all. I mean, that would really summarize uh, our experience also. I have two questions. Uh, on our experience. So one of the issues is the impact of spoken language um, in, the, in the formal language learning. For example, uh, you know, we try to canalize things based on uh, you know, formal writing language or reading language, whereas uh, students, uh, when they come to the classroom, they have um, really different types of skills developed in the spoken language, which impact the canalization, no? even within a particular classroom, you know, forget about uh, across the classroom or across schools. So this is a real creative challenge. Uh, you know, <coughs> you have any suggestions on this? You know, it's it's a, that is the big challenge, right? That that if we believe that that if the goal of your program is to develop <coughs> literacy, okay in students, right? Then you need to decide where we're starting that literacy <coughs> instruction. And whether or not you're starting literacy instruction in the same way you did in the old country, making assumptions that what children bring by the age of five is whatever it is, right? Or six whenever they enter school. Or whether you're actually saying, I need to be extremely adaptable and have different ways in which they can enter literacy depending on where they are, which would persuade me that you want to have at least a sense of the range of your kids, right? And that begin to be doing within the program your own research about saying this particular characteristics of spoken language right, can support this kind of a program into literacy, and these other ones will not. We need to, to, to make certain that we keep them in using the spoken language enough to do what, right? But again, it's a, it's a, it, the ideological is really important here, right? Is it the wrong spoken language, or is it just not enough spoken language, right? Because one of the ways in which children learn those academic styles of talking is by being in academic settings where people use those particular ways of speaking. And home language is never like school language. It shouldn't be, right? And so if what you think they're missing the school language, right, that they need to be able to acquire literacy, that's one issue. The other issue is not enough of it is acquired. They can't speak at all but they understand the spoken language. So then if they understand the spoken language, the real question is how do you introduce them to the script, right? Because the script is a big issue. If it's an alphabetic language and it complements everything that they're doing at school, not a problem. But if it's a different writing system, then you have to decide, does it depend on the spoken language? If it's a, a writing system that doesn't depend on the spoken language, you have a different issue. So I, I think that, that those are kind of, uh, that I think what you learn in your program will be enriching to all of us. We need to know that. And I hope that you will then uh, begin to publish and write about what you learned. I hope you're doing lots of videotapes okay, 
Uh, now that we have the, the possibility of videoing students to be able to say, here's student at point A, at point B, at point C, because that will teach us all exactly what we need to know. We don't know the answers. Yes. You know, I can't imagine language not being embedded in culture, right? Whether it's either the maintenance or the academic. I mean, every time we open our mouths, in fact, to make a choice about using language, we actually are doing it within the ways of speaking that are appropriate culturally, right? Uh, ways of being polite, ways of interacting with people, uh, ways in which one reads a text, right? So all of those things, I see them as, as cultural. But I really like the way you're thinking. And what's, what's amazing and what I love about what you've said is that those are, I'm hoping for the organization and for all of you, that those are precisely the questions that are at the edge of the field, right? Uh, that we're at, because you, you, the, the question that you raised about parents and what they want, right? Parents and what, and again, remember that a lot of times parents don't know what you know, right? And of course, you can actually put forward a program and advertise it enough and market it, okay? And, and that, that lure of, yes, my children will actually be able to speak to my mother when I go back, right? Uh, and yet, there's also some languages that it's not about just my mother. It's a commodity, okay? It's something that if they speak well and they use well, may in fact open doors for them in their future, right? And so there are languages that you then would prioritize one thing as opposed to another. So I think that those, those are, and, and how do you reach parents? And at some level, how do you also inform parents? What are your parent community liaison activities that often will want to persuade parents, here are the choices that we're making, and here's what we're doing, right? In, in the larger groups where you could actually be doing the play groups and the, the, the academically and the, I mean, wouldn't it be lovely if you could do all of those things and the public schools would also support you? And that's my ideal world, right? But anyway, there we are. I'm just looking over at, at the uh, Office of English Language Education. So no, it used to be Obemla, Office of Bilingual Education, right? I mean, and it changed its name, this agency. I just thought I'd tell you that because he's in the room, right? But, but at any rate, but when but we change. Jose didn't change. No, no, Jose did not change it. And I'm so glad Jose is there. When I heard that Jose was there, I just thought, oh, wow, yes, I've been waiting for this for so long. But anyway, so. Um, but so because of that, I think that we, we really want to bring, bring together those, those kinds of opportunities. So I didn't answer your question, but I think you can answer your question and hope that you will and share it with me. Thank you. people who have been here for two, in this country for 50 years and then they have learned the language but only to the extent they needed it and not beyond that. So how does that component of need figure in your framework? 
You know, and, and, and I totally agree with you uh, that individuals become bilingual, and I would put it, when one language does not suffice to meet all of their communicative needs. Right? I have communicative needs, okay, and one language will not suffice. So I have this grandmother that lives in the house and always speaks to me in language X, and if I want to speak to my grandmother, I better speak to her in that particular language. So need, in fact, is a huge, a huge element of why people acquire languages. But that particular need also has a great deal to do with their sense of who they are. So, for example, there's a wonderful book about a young man who talks about it, and at this moment I'm not going to remember the, the name of the book, but I, but I will remember it and can send it to you. He talks about having not learned Yiddish. And he says, I grew up in a household okay, in which everyone in the neighborhood spoke Yiddish. Okay? His father was not a Yiddish speaker, okay? and his mother's family spoke Yiddish, everyone else spoke Yiddish, and he decided he was not going to be a Yiddish speaker. And so that was a sense of identity where he says, now think of the work that it took not to learn a language, right? That I heard all around me all the time, right? But I had to, when I learned a word, quickly forget it, because okay? I was not going to be a Yiddish speaker. So the intersection of that need, that sense of self, okay? that desire to be or not be, and opportunity. And so when I think about, I mean, when I, when I talk about immigrants, and, and particularly the immigrants of, 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 of my, uh, my own background, I often say, have you noticed that when the immigrants come, they go to where the cheap rents are? Right? And it's not the case that fancy people who are English speaking rush to their communities to have conversations with them. They have very few opportunities for acquiring language, for living language, right? So. The people that I work with all around me are all only speakers of the language that I speak. Right? So I don't have those individuals coming to me. At, at my university, I run a program in which undergraduates are actually teaching English to the janitors. Right? Why are they teaching English to the janitors? And I'm trying to actually support them in teaching English to the ground. Because there is no opportunity to learn. And opportunity and need go together. right? So in those communities in which especially poor immigrants arrive, there isn't a need because there isn't an opportunity, right? So those two things go together. But indeed, that, that, that rule, which I think you've actually put it theoretically, you really have got to have that particular context where you have that one language doesn't suffice and you have the welcoming, because one of the things that Bonnie Norton wrote about is if nobody wants to speak to you, that you work around, even if they're English speakers, it's not going to be very uh, a condition for language acquisition. Thanks so much for being such a wonderful audience. I look forward to talking to you more. Oh, Cornelia, yes. Yeah, let's It will definitely yeah. take training. You know, and, I, and I might say all of the above. I mean, it, it really, I think it's a personal issue, right? And in my experience, right, uh, the best teacher for children is a teacher who believes that those children can learn, right? If you have that quality in a teacher, she could have just newly arrived, but has the tolerance to understand the experience base of these students. I'm not teaching in Stuttgart, right? So I need to actually treat them quite differently, right? Or it could be someone who has lived the whole process of having the language erode. But it's a personal, I think it's a personal characteristic for me. But I'll let you tell me in your research what you find. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bala Thank you very much.